Hello, everyone. We are back. Hello, we have missed you this entire month, and we hope you are ready for another episode. That's right. Episode two of Crime After Crime. I am one of your hosts, John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Thank you guys so much for spending more time with us. And thank you to everyone that supported the first episode. I truly, truly appreciate having you all out there. I want to give an individual thanks, not only to Danielle's (laughs) fans, the Holland fam, right? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and the brain scratchers out there. But I also want to give a big shout out to anyone that found the podcast that maybe didn't know us at all. And we're hoping that maybe you'll come check out our YouTube channels, see what else we do in all of this as well. The first episode was viewed on YouTube currently over uh, 12,500 times, and it's growing still. The podcast version was listened to over 11,300 times, and it's still growing by about 200 listens a day. We hit number 12 on iTunes chart for history podcasts in the US and also in several other countries. Uh, I think we hit it in Canada. I think we hit it in Australia and Great Britain as well. That's all according to Chartable. Uh, This is all new stuff for us, so I'm just really excited to see that we had what I consider such a strong initial launch. What do you think, Danielle? Oh, absolutely. I'm telling you, I was not sure how people were going to react. And, you know, again, splitting off from our separate channels and doing something a little bit different, it was exciting. And this is a totally new world podcasting. It's very interesting. And I feel less in control. (laughs) Call me crazy. (laughs) Well, because on YouTube, it's very different. I feel like you see a lot more. But it's here, true. you just see numbers and you're just kind of hoping all those numbers mean really good things. So. Yeah, it is true. It does. It feels less centralized. Like YouTube gives us a dashboard. We go to this one dashboard and we can see everything that's going on with the channel and how individual videos are performing. And of course, read your comments about those individual videos. And here it does. It feels just so much looser. We're on all these different platforms. Uh, We just got added to Stitcher. So if anyone wanted us on Stitcher, we're on there. Uh, Spreaker is another one that Mm -hmm. just added us as well. So um, it's it's really interesting. And I don't know how to measure success in this area because of that. But I can say based on the comments that I'm seeing from you guys, both on Twitter and at least on the YouTube version, uh, as well as some reviews that people have written also uh, that I'm catching, it it seems like you guys really enjoy it. And we really appreciate all your support because this is it's a little intimidating. It's a little different for us. (laughs) Yes, it definitely is. But I did quickly before we dive right on into everything. I wanted to take a minute to talk about voting because that's another thing, you know, how we're basing our success. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> is talking about voting. And there seemed to be a little bit of a confusion happening on our previous episode on how exactly you vote. So if you are listening audio only, so just podcast form, you can follow John and I on our Twitter pages. So mine is at Danielle Hallen with no I. And I'm at Lord and Arts. That's L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. So right after the podcast releases, um, either John or I will be putting up a poll there where you can vote for who you want your winner and not winner to be. (laughs) And then we will also... Just call it the John, Danielle. I know you want to. Just say the John. I was trying to be good, John, but if you want to back me in a corner... Okay. Okay. So the not winner. Yes. 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 How, do, how do they do it, Danielle? How do they vote? So on YouTube, there's another option. So if you are viewing, so I kind of feel like I didn't explain this properly last time, but at the end of the video, when we're talking about casting your vote, a little eye will pop up in the corner of your YouTube screen. And all you have to do is click that real quick and it'll give you a very fast, easy poll. Now, I know some of you may get distracted. I do the same thing while I'm listening to YouTube videos. So this time and from here on out, I will make sure I leave a timestamp in the description box. So if you would rather listen to everything and just go straight back to the time where the poll is and vote then, it should still be fairly easy and simple. But I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way because I know a lot of people seem to be confused. That's going to make it really convenient for me to use all my different YouTube logins to go in and vote for myself. (laughs) Vote for yourself over and over. Thank you so much, Danielle. I appreciate that. (laughs) So, Oh, my goodness. While we're speaking about voting, 
You have tallied the results. Do I understand that? Yes. Okay. And I before, have tallied the results. Before we release those results, let's understand what's at risk here. First of all, the crime after crime coffee mug can only be used by the winner for that particular episode. What? It looks like she's grabbing something <laughs> and, and smiling devilishly. <laughs> I am not. Okay, okay. Uh, but we also <laughs> decided that the winner will get to determine who goes first in terms of telling the story on this current episode. So whoever wins will be able to decide if they want to go first or second for talking about today's topic, the sleepwalking defense. So, okay, with all that said, Danielle. Are we ready for the results? We're ready for the results. So it turns out the most bizarre weapon was wasabi pants. <laughs> no way. Oh, and she has to rub it in by holding Got the my mug. mug. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say I'm surprised, but uh, I at least saw the Twitter poll. I, I went and I voted for you, believe it or not, on the Twitter poll. I voted uh, for you as well. It's and, only fair. Yeah. And I saw the numbers and I was just getting crushed. I guess people just don't respect how dangerous a hot dog tom can be. <laughs> <laughs> Hot dog tongs are very, very dangerous. I think people just can't get over wasabi on pants. It just doesn't make any sense. I think yeah. wrapping your head around that, you just can't do it. Yeah, you just there's, can't. there's a lot of strange aspects to that story when you think about it. Just weaponizing pants in that way, the whole thought about doing that. Uh, and then how he executed an attack on her and then her not and, showing up to court. I mean... It, and then him thinking of that in such a small amount of time. Yeah, yeah, it is. I can, I can see grabbing hot dog tongs as like your only option. Right. But as I said in the episode, why? Whose first thoughts? Hmm. Let me go to the fridge. <laughs> I yeah. have to create a weapon. I'm so mad at my ex-girlfriend. I'm going to cover her <laughs> pants in wasabi. Where's my wasabi? <laughs> yeah, and attack her with it. I'm still shaking my head at that one. So I graciously concede, yes, absolutely, you deserve that one. It was a really good story, uh, and it was very well told. So congratulations, Danielle. Thank you I will, very much. I will retire my crime after crime <laughs> coffee mug for a month. But um, better I'm, luck next time. I, I do, think I, I do have a mug. Have what is it? Oh no, you pulling something. What is it? I That's can't a see brain it. scratch searchlight <laughs> mug that I will use instead. There we go. There we go. All right. You can so, still stick to your roots. That's right. That's right. Don't I quit still, your day job. <laughs> I have some pride here. Okay. <laughs> Well, let's get into today's topic. Today we are talking about the sleepwalking defense. And I can say I've talked about this on my YouTube channel, Lord and Arts, in case you were wondering, several times in the past. Uh, I used to do a movie review show and I reviewed a couple movies that were about this topic. Um, and then I had an episode of Brain Scratch that I just did earlier this year that also touched on this topic. And when Danielle actually mentioned this as a potential topic for the show, uh, I had a story that popped in my head right away. And I think it's probably the most famous of the sleepwalking defense stories out there. So many of you might know it, but you might not know all the details that I was able to find in it. Um, but before we get started with the stories, which by the way, by the way, Danielle, do you want to go first? Yes. Okay. I always like to just get things out of the way. I was oh. a kid in class where, you know, I might not have been looking forward to presenting something, but I was the first one to do it. So I could go <laughs> right. sit down and have an anxiety attack with, all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we will keep the same order. Danielle will go first. I'll go second. But I'm going to start with just a little information about sleepwalking. This comes from the National Sleep Foundation. And their website states that sleepwalking is a behavior disorder that originates during deep sleep and results in walking or performing other complex behaviors while asleep. It is much more common in children than adults and is more likely to occur if a person is sleep deprived. Because a sleepwalker typically remains in deep sleep throughout the episode, he or she may be difficult to awaken and will probably not remember the sleepwalking incident. Symptoms of sleepwalking disorder range from simply sitting up in bed and looking around to walking around the room or house to leaving the house and even driving long distances, 
as shocking as that sounds, and by the way, that might come up in my story. Teaser. Yeah, it is a common misconception that a sleepwalker should not be awakened. In fact, it can be quite dangerous not to wake a sleepwalker. Once again, might also come into play in my story. Uh oh. See, because I'd always been told not to mess with someone that's sleepwalking. But the further I dove into this, I realized there are a lot of things that I don't know correctly and that are wild. So I've, I've heard that, too. And it's I think there's this thought that if someone is sleepwalking and you startle them, that it's going to shock them in some way or they might hurt themselves as as they wake up. But um, that's about as far as I was able to. To find out. Well, it. I also might have found some more information on that yep. that I'll get into in a little bit. But first, I wanted to talk about a few definitions, Daniel's definitions. And New I wish we, we had a little jingle to go after that. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to talk about two definitions in particular, one that is involved with the story that I am bringing forward and one that's just kind of general. So the first is automatism. And that is the performance of actions without conscious thought, intent, or malice. And people don't necessarily have to be asleep when this occurs. It's kind of like when you have a habit that you do that you don't think about, like smacking your lips or you know something of the sort. But it is often linked with people who suffer from sleepwalking episodes frequently. And then there is homicidal somnambulism. And that is the technical definition for murdering someone while sleepwalking so while in a state of not being fully conscious right right and i i could already hear just from the way those were phrased that the legal implications around that are very interesting and and tough because yes. essentially you're talking about the fact that i didn't decide to do this you know i i suffer with some type of sleepwalking disorder and i wasn't in my right mind at that time of doing it but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are insane as well, which, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the legal ramifications on this are are quite bizarre. And uh, we're going to hear some interesting stories here. I'm, I'm excited. Danielle, you, uh, you ready to go? I'm ready. All so right. So today I'm going to be talking to you about Brian Thomas. And this is a little bit of a difficult case. I'm going to try to leave out some of the gnarly parts of this story. But... Brian Thomas was 59 years old when a sleepwalking and automatism disorder caused him to strangle his 57-year-old wife, Christine, in July of 2008. Whoa. So Brian actually had a very long and difficult history with night terrors and sleepwalking that had been affecting his life since he was a child. And that's another thing that links back to sleepwalking is usually if you have night terrors, they kind of go hand in hand. And it also goes hand in hand with people who do violent acts while sleepwalking. So up until this point, it had been pretty innocent and he had never had a lot of issues with his sleepwalking. It just happened a lot until July of 2008. So Brian and his wife, Christine, went on vacation in their camper in Wales and they frequently took these trips to get away for a bit. But this trip was special for them because they were actually celebrating their 40th anniversary, which is a massive deal. A lot of people don't make it that far, so they were really excited. But Brian also had been diagnosed with depression. And usually when they took these camper trips, he would stop taking his medication oh. because he felt that it would make him less vigilant. And usually when they were out in the camper, they were going to new locations and places they weren't familiar with. And he just wanted to make sure he was aware at all times. Plus, he didn't like driving long distances while taking the medication. So this trip was really no different. So I can, I'm can, i sure you can see where this is kind of going. Yeah, we've got a lot of bad factors <laughs> stacking up yes. here. So Brian and Christine had picked out what they believed was the perfect spot for their anniversary getaway. And they had been having an amazing time together. But on the night of the crime, the trip became a little bit stressful for both of them. There had been a lot of young boys riding around on motorcycles, and they had been endlessly racing back and forth and around the parking lot where Brian and Christine's camper was parked. They were doing tricks, they were making a lot of noise, and they just wouldn't stop. And it was causing a big disturbance and putting Brian in particular under a lot of distress because they had hoped for a quiet and romantic getaway, but it was becoming far from that because of all of the noise. 
So once the racing finally came to an end, both Brian and Christine went to sleep, thankful to finally escape the ruckus. But it wasn't long until Brian started having very vivid dreams of their camper being burglarized, specifically by the young men that had been racing around in the parking lot earlier that day. But it wasn't just any dream. He was having a full-blown night terror. So the thing that he had struggled with his entire life. So Brian, shortly after, woke up from what he believed was a dream and found his wife laying responseless on the bed beside him. And he started to kind of put two and two together. But he was very confused. You know, he could vividly remember having this dream and he vividly remembers attacking this person in the camper. So apparently he describes this person as a man in blue jeans and a black fleece top. And this man wasn't looking to rob anything, but he was actually laying on top of Brian's wife, attacking her. So obviously as a husband, he was filled with rage and he was panicking and started yelling at this man and ended up grabbing this man by the throat in an attempt to get him off of his wife. But after a few minutes of struggling with this strange man and when Brian finally gained a full state of wakefulness, he realized that he had not in fact been strangling a burglar and this attacker but instead he had been strangling his wife so obviously when he's in this state of confusion you know he didn't know if he had done it he swore from what he saw in his dream that he thought was reality that he had been going after attacker and attacker so he frantically called authorities and was screaming that he needed help and he kept saying it was because of what he had done he thought and the operator even recorded him saying you know what have i done i've been trying to wake her up i think i might have killed my wife i thought someone broke in it was the boys but it wasn't the boys it was christine so he was really in a state of confusion and panic and he stayed that way because when authorities arrived he was violently shaking and obviously in shock, standing outside of his camper. He was crying uncontrollably. He said he was so confused and he couldn't believe what he did and he wasn't even sure if he did anything. And unfortunately, he did end up arrested arrested and charged with his wife's murder because he had technically admitted to murdering her over the phone. He had told the 911 operator, which this was in Wales, so it wasn't 911, but- Yeah, um, I think it's 999 out there I think Yeah, I think it is as well, but he he technically had admitted to it. But authorities at this point didn't know how deep and confusing this case would get because it wasn't as simple as murder as they thought. He was using the sleepwalking defense. So Brian had tried to explain to authorities that he had struggled with night terrors and sleepwalking his entire life. And he explained the boys on their motorcycles and how he thought they broke into his camper. And he told them that he was just trying to protect his wife from an attacker, unaware that he was having a dream and was actually harming her himself. But crimes while sleepwalking are not common. That's one thing that I saw when I was looking this up. And so no one was quite sure how to handle the situation. Prosecutors originally were seeking a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, but that would have eventually put Brian in psychiatric custody, which is not where he thought he belonged. It's not where, you know, his attorneys thought he belonged. So in an attempt to figure out if maybe he was telling the truth and that his crime, in fact, was committed while sleepwalking, they did highly sophisticated tests that were carried out by sleep experts that just proved further that he did struggle quite a bit with sleepwalking and night terrors. So when they paired this with the fact that Brian had discontinued his medicine, his antidepressants, it meant that he was also likely suffering from withdrawal symptoms. So basically he had created this perfect storm for violent nightmares and sleepwalking. And after looking at all of the evidence and looking at his medical history and all these different tests that were done, he was released in 2009 without any consequence other than knowing that he had accidentally killed his wife. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I think you're going to be amazed at how many similarities are going on between our stories, but. Oh, well, you know, when I was researching all the different stories, they all were very similar, which makes it that much more chilling. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's 
got to be something deeper going on with sleepwalking and these particular crimes. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. It kind of reminds me of sometimes you'll see advertising for law firms that specialize in a particular type of defense. And I'm almost wondering at this point, uh, because there's been enough cases, I, I think I saw on Wikipedia that I think there's like 60 cases up until 2005 yeah. that have been noted where someone has has tried to invoke this sleepwalking defense in some way. Uh, and a lot of the times they don't win. Um, so it almost sounds to me like, you know, as a just looking at it as a legal defense, not talking about the truth of the matter, that there's exactly. a certain way to put your case together. And you kind of touched on some of the same stuff that I'm going to touch on. But one of those is the testing that they do to verify that this person does have some type of sleep disorder, uh, looking into family history and all that kind of stuff. Where I get kind of caught on your story is thinking about the fact that he was taking medication and stopped taking his medication. Because if you flip that idea and say, uh, I'm not responsible because I got too drunk one night and decided to drive my car and I killed a family. Exactly. You know, there, you, you still can't get off that. So how did you get around the fact that you knew there was a responsibility to you in terms of taking care of yourself and people around you by taking that medication and you decided not to? Exactly. And that this, this whole researching all of this has been frustrating in a way because I keep second guessing and questioning even what I believe. And I was reading a lot into testing and proving this and there is really no good way to prove anything. Yeah. So where, where you have cases where you have obvious evidence and, you know, possible DNA and things left behind with this, how do you prove someone did something in their sleep when their victim nine times out of 10 isn't there to tell their own story. Yeah. And I was I was looking deeper into the different things that they do to prove this. And the best solution they've come up with is, again, seeing if there's any sort of history and if this has been something they've been dealing with their whole life. But other than that, they can do the tests that I was speaking about in Brian's case. But even then, a lot of people that sleepwalk don't do it regularly enough. Right. for them to catch them in an episode. So you could go in for this testing and you could end up not sleepwalking, but that doesn't necessarily mean you haven't ever or that you don't have the potential to. And then on top of hoping to catch someone sleepwalking in one of these tests to also catch them in a potentially violent episode. And something that really was a little terrifying to me is that they said the best way to see if you could trigger a violent attack from someone sleepwalking is to touch them. So <laughs> exactly. And so that's what brings me to, you know, we heard earlier that it's, it's not necessarily true that you shouldn't wake someone up while sleepwalking. But after hearing that, I certainly don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely I would... don't want to touch someone if it means they could potentially attack have a violent you. outbreak. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. That is super, super bizarre. Um, and I, I still struggle with it also. There's no way for them to test that particular time, those particular stressors. And that's part of this sleepwalking defense is they will typically kind of stack up the stressors and say, hey, look, this person was very susceptible because they hadn't slept in X amount of time. Possibly they could have been, you know, taking some type of alcohol or narcotic or something like that. There's there's kind of typical blocks that I'm seeing in these stories in terms of them putting that defense together. But the one really interesting thing about it is that, like you were saying before, if you flip those, those are also great motives for murder. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's how do you determine if it, you know, all of the stress physically or mentally you know, really triggered someone to sleepwalk or just really triggered someone into wanting to harm somebody. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, oh my gosh, it's so bizarre and it's such a double edged sword. And I feel like my mind has just been reeling over this since starting to research. Did you bump into any information about there being a motive in that particular case? So I did find a very off article, which makes me believe, you know, it's one of those situations where people really were trying to find a reason. Um, apparently I've seen rumor that, you know, he wanted a divorce, but again, I cannot okay. substantiate that claim. So, you know, it's, I feel like anywhere though, you could kind of find 
a reason. Um, but you know, that's just kind of like a go-to though for couples is, oh, well, he wanted to harm her because right. they weren't happy together, you know, but then I'm like, okay, I get that. But they're also celebrating their 40th anniversary. That's quite the time to carry out that act. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> a really good point. And are you really going to put this whole trip together? And, um, and one of the things I ran into about this type of information is sleepwalkers, for them to do very complex things, they need to be in an environment that they're familiar with. Exactly. And this totally takes them out of that realm. And on top of that, he would have had to, you know, how would he have planned that these boys were going to be there? What would have been his right. other excuse? Just, you know, it, it wouldn't have, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Honestly. It's just, it's very interesting, but also in my research, I was really looking into more things that they usually try to look for when looking if someone's really sleepwalking or not, if they're just trying to use this defense. And one thing I found is that people who are usually using the defense to benefit themselves and they're, you know, lying is they will be able to recall a lot more details. Yeah. So the biggest issue people that are lying come into is telling too much information right and right. usually people who did sleepwalk they are confused so it fits perfectly with his story he was very confused and all he really remembered was this dream yeah i've heard different kind of two different views on that um sometimes they're saying that yeah like the the information we started with from um the national sleep foundation that you know sometimes they're not going to remember anything but i also read at i think it's uh, psychology today mm -hmm. where they were talking about a different aspect where a hallucination could be going on at the same time and wow. in those cases the sleepwalker is really able to recall a lot more and this one sounds like it fits that because he's recalling yeah. that he was attacking someone, that the person was on top of his wife. So that seems almost like a hallucination that's going on during the act of sleepwalking. And if you consider that, you know, he wasn't taking his medication properly, I'm sure that the the possibility of that increases. So. Exactly. And on top of that as well, you know, there are so many different things that come into play here. You know, like you said, the hallucination. And it's like every time someone comes forward with information to kind of help prove or disprove this defense and people's arguments, it almost rules out one of the other options. So it's so frustrating. Yeah. And, you know, I was looking particularly at what doctors have to say, like medical doctors and then what psychologists have to say. And they can't figure it out either because doctors usually will send their patients to psychologists saying that for them, there's such a small percentage of people that sleepwalk with these disorders that become violent, that there has to be some sort of underlying emotional problem or, you know, mental disorder. But psychologists say there's no underlying mental illness, that there's nothing. And it, it is something, you know, going on in the brain and with their specific disorders. So they can't even figure this mess out. So yeah, I, I even looked into the angle of um, just do people think that sleepwalking is real period. And I couldn't find much to support many people contradicting that I think in general, everyone believes at some level of sleepwalking is real. Someone knows someone that is has experienced that in some way, uh, mm -hmm. or some version of it, you know, um, your spouse might speak in the middle of the night while they're sleeping or, or something along those lines. And then it kind of ramps up from there. I think the real question when it comes to the sleepwalking defense is the level of complexity of what they're doing. And is that reasonable for still being sleepwalking? Or is it possible that they're saying that they were sleepwalking when they were actually, you know, fully awake and engaged. So. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Very strange case. All right. Well, let's get on to the second story. Ready for your crime after crime? I am ready. And I purposely didn't look into this okay. because you told me you were doing it. So I am interested to hear. Yeah, this I was so famous. I was pretty, pretty committed to this right off the bat um, because it is. It is a very bizarre story, so let's go ahead and get started. One of the most famous cases of the sleepwalking defense is the story of Kenneth Parks. It was 1987, and Parks was a 23-year-old husband and new father living in Pickering, Ontario, Canada. By the way, I noticed a couple of very interesting sleepwalking stories coming out of Canada. We might touch on one of those later today, too. Uh, when he met his wife, Karen, she was a runaway. 
He convinced her to get reconnected with her parents, which they very much appreciated. By all reports, he had a good relationship with his in-laws. His mother-in-law even referred to him as her gentle giant. Kenneth and Karen would frequently go visit her parents, but that would soon change. Kenneth Parks was struggling with insomnia, likely due in part to a bad gambling addiction that had added a significant amount of stress to his life. He wound up taking money out of his family's savings and gambling it away. He then embezzled over $30,000 from his employer to cover his debts. He was eventually caught and fired. They also filed court proceedings against him with a five-month-old that he was now supposed to be taken care of, no job, and a pending trial. Things were certainly not looking good for Kenneth. When he would get temporary work, usually as an electrician, he would again gamble his earnings away. Ashamed of what was going on, Kenneth avoided seeing his in-laws for a period of time. I believe it was about two months. Parks was in a total spiral. He was getting regular headaches and standing at five foot, five inches tall, he went from weighing 240 to 310 pounds. He was regularly arguing with his wife and had been sleeping on the couch. But Kenneth started working towards cleaning up his act. He attended his first Gamblers Anonymous meeting and was planning on letting his in-laws know the truth about his struggles. They lined up a day to have a barbecue together where Parks was planning on telling them the truth and also helping them fix their furnace. He states that he fell asleep watching television and regained consciousness seeing his mother-in-law's face. The tendons in his hands had been severed. There was blood everywhere. He drove himself to a police station and told officers, my God, I've just killed two people. I've just killed my mother and father-in-law. So what really happened? Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. I know. I've already got chills on this one. Um, and it's just, it's, it, it doesn't get much better from here. May 24th, 1987. That was the same day that the barbecue was supposed to happen. Uh, Karen invited Kenneth back into the bed that night but he insisted that he should stay sleeping on the couch until he could make things better. He watched TV and fell asleep. Around 2 a.m., he got up from that spot. He put on a coat, put on his shoes, grabbed his car keys, and got into his car. Now, he either left the garage door or the front door wide open. Reports differ on that. Mm -hmm. But then he drove 14 miles to the home of his in-laws in Scarborough. His in-laws had previously given him a key to their home, which he was able to use to get in, supposedly while still sleepwalking, but not before he went to the trunk of his car and grabbed his tire iron. He entered the home, at some point grabbed a kitchen knife and took the kitchen phone off the hook and left it off the hook. He then went up to the bedroom of the sleeping in-laws. He choked Dennis until he was unconscious and stabbed him with the kitchen knife. Barbara must have woken up and made a run for it. Her body was found about six feet away from the bedroom. She had been beaten with the tire iron and stabbed multiple times with the kitchen knife. Reportedly, Kenneth then headed for their teenage daughter's room. He stopped outside the door, stood there for a moment, then ran downstairs and left the home. Dennis, the father-in-law, would wind up surviving the attack. Unfortunately, his wife Barbara didn't. She was only 42 years old. At 4.45 a.m., Parks arrived at the police station and gave a bizarre confession. Officers noted that he seemed completely out of it. He was distressed and shaking, and he wasn't responding much to his now shredded hands, including several completely severed tendons. Um, one of the things about attacking with a kitchen knife is they don't have a hilt on them. So mm -hmm. I, I hear about this in cases occasionally. You try to stab someone and you will actually, your hand will slide yeah, up onto, slide onto down, the blade. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's likely how his tendons got set. Ooh, man. Investigators could find no motive for Parks to have done this. He even stated himself about his mother-in-law, I loved her. She was great to me. He was evaluated by a psychiatrist named Dr. R.H. Billings, who had a recent patient that was dealing with sleepwalking issues. He wondered if the same thing could be happening in this case. Parks underwent sleep tests and psychological examinations. It was discovered that his family history did include several instances of sleepwalking disorder and that Parks himself was likely suffering from it as well. 
EEGs confirmed that Parks did have abnormal brain activity during deep sleep and periods of partial awakenings. While I did find some information to suggest that EEGs can be affected by certain medications, I didn't find anything in terms of faking the results of an EEG test. It just it doesn't seem like yeah. it's feasible. After a year in prison, Parks eventually got his trial. Park's legal defense team would stick with his story and use the sleepwalking defense. Uh, they argued that a number of external factors contributed to this situation. His pending trial for the money he had embezzled, uh, the new child, the marriage issues, the gambling addiction. And they basically said that the likelihood of this pre precise combination of factors basically wouldn't happen again. And that wouldn't, you know, the, him being able to do this again was yeah. extremely unlikely because how would you get all those factors to line up just in the perfect way for that to happen? Prosecutors, the guys on the other side of the courtroom said, this defense is simply ludicrous. That's literally a quote from them. Yeah. But the most important opinions about the sleepwalking defense in this case would certainly come from the jury. They deliberated for nine hours and came back to the courtroom to render their verdict Kenneth Parks was found not guilty. Not only did Parks avoid a life sentence for the murder, he wasn't even sentenced to psychiatric care because sleepwalking is not necessarily a sign of insanity. He walked out of court a free man. The case was appealed several years later, but the original verdict was upheld. Kenneth Parks is the first person in Canada to successfully use the sleepwalking defense. Uh, he was, did you have a question? It can wait. I've got lots of questions. <laughs> they can <Okay>. all wait. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember them all. I sure will. Um, uh, Parks was treated with medication and has never had another sleepwalking crime or apparently even an instance of sleepwalking reported. Many people still question if this was an actual occurrence or if it was just a clever legal defense. The latest news story about Kenneth Parks comes from 2006. With six children at that point, he ran to be a trustee for the Durham School District. A few articles were written about the community's concerns with his past. Even though some may excuse his crimes while he was sleepwalking, he still had pled guilty to fraud for stealing over $30,000 from his former employer. Um, he did pay restitution for that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't find any outcome to this part of the story, but I also couldn't find any references to him holding any position in a school district in Durham County. So I would assume he probably didn't get that position. Uh, I was also curious about his marriage. And, That's, uh, that was my biggest question. What does his wife think about all of this? Yeah. And uh, basically, according to a review that I found from 2015 at the World Science Festival where they discussed this case, uh, Kenneth and Karen did wind up getting divorced. And the guy that was talking about it was basically saying, you know, he killed her mother. So, I mean, what are the odds that they would have been able to stay together after going through something like that? So... But I still don't know, Danielle. I don't know if I believe this one. I do not know if I believe it either. I'm struggling a lot with the spe the things in specific he was dealing with and the barbecue and, you know, having to admit to something that you might not be proud of. And I don't know. I understand that while sleepwalking, you can do very specific things like drive long distances. But everything about this just seems very specific and planned out in a sense you know driving all the way there taking the phone off of the hook yeah i am struggling a lot with this i am not sure what to think yeah and the the first thing when i first heard this story that really caught me was the driving thing i mean to think about driving 14 miles now admittedly you know two o'clock to three o'clock in the morning you're probably not going to have a lot of traffic going on but you've got to understand how to navigate intersections yeah you know the the directions for getting to their house i mean admittedly they had spent a lot of time there before uh is it really that familiar of a route um there's just there's a lot of questions here and one thing i also struggle with is when they talked about that they couldn't find a motive for this to happen and i was wondering if from his perspective this could have been another answer to his financial problems that's that was where my brain went immediately as well. And I was very shocked to hear you say that they were struggling to find a motive because his financial problems, you know, he obviously was in a lot of emotional turmoil. And I don't know, I think there's a lot of different motives that could be intertwined in that. 
Yeah. And, and oh it doesn't goodness. necessarily mean that he hated his in-laws. I don't, I don't think that that would be the only motivating factor. I just think in his head, I mean, think about the lengths he went to when it came to money. I mean, he literally exactly. embezzled. Yeah. He, 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 I think he was basically falsely billing his company and then having the money sent directly to him to the tune of over $30,000. So would it be so far for him to think, well, what's another source of money that I can get? Oh, well, we've got the in-laws. And if they both died, then yep. my wife would likely get something. Yeah, uh, and he, that's, I think that's such an obvious motive. So I'm so shocked they didn't. Oh, my yeah. goodness. But this there is, irritating. is <laughs> there is a wrench in it, though, and that is yeah. the teenage daughter. And I've seen different reports that say that there might have been actually more than one child in the house. Yeah. And of course, the big wrench is he drives himself to the police and, you know, it, admits to all this. Mm -hmm. um, but could that have been part of his plan as well, that he was always going to admit to all this? I'm just wondering if he went through attacking the first two people went to the daughter's door and just decided that it was too much for him and he could not kill a child. Because I would assume that part of the inheritance would probably get split with any other kids that were alive as well. I um, agree, especially as a newer parent, that might be something that just was a line he wasn't willing to cross over. And you even look at criminals in prisons. They do not like people who have harmed children. <laughs> like they right. might have done some crazy things, but people who have harmed children are in a totally different category. So... I can see him planning this out and potentially stopping there because he just couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did bump into a really good analysis of this. It was written at Psychology Today. Uh, it's titled Sleep Driving and Sleep Killing, the Kenneth Parks case. I really recommend that you guys check it out, but I wanted to share some of it uh, here with you. Um, they note that he had issues controlling his urges. You're talking about the gambling addiction, you know, stealing from the company. Uh, yep. So just if, if we're looking at profiling him as, as a potential criminal, as a potential murderer, um, we've already got kind of one check in the box when it comes to controlling his urges. His wife didn't know him to sleepwalk. But he did talk in his sleep several times, and she did note it. She did note that it was hard to wake him up sometimes; that he would get into a really deep sleep. Uh, his mother did have one instance where he did sleepwalk. She says that he was thirteen or fourteen. Some reports say eleven, uh, but that she found him with his legs dangling out of a six-story window. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his grandfather also was a sleepwalker who would frequently walk around the home and even cook meals, but then not eat them. Uh, this is something I've heard about when I released my episodes on the channel. Uh, I heard from several people that watched them and said, you know what, I get up in the middle of the night and I cook things. And uh, yeah, so sleepwalking. Once again, familiar tasks that you do within familiar environments exactly are very reasonable for for this these sleepwalking occurrences which which does make me think you know from the way they're describing their relationship with you know his in-laws i'm assuming they probably were over there a bit so mm -hmm. that's why i like i want to get caught up on the driving but again as you said familiar tasks and maybe driving there was just you know the first thing that popped in his head and yeah. I don't know. I'm struggling still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and also consider that, you know, he was planning on going there later that day and that he obviously probably wasn't looking forward to what he was going to have to do. And if he was in one of those states of hallucination, like we were talking about before. Exactly. You know, maybe him driving there was perfectly normal. Maybe once he got there, things got weird. I mean, the point at where you're grabbing the tire iron out of your car you have to wonder what's what's going on, even if it is a hallucination, what's going on with that part of the story. When you go into the kitchen and you grab a knife and you take the phone off the hook. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just it looks that, like premeditation. A of, yeah, a lot of premeditation. And one thing that I find interesting comparing it to a lot of stories that I went through is that most stories that I went through where they're fairly certain that sleepwalking, you know, that was the cause. That's what started it all. Most of the time, I mean, they have a reason for the attack. They've got a very specific dream or, as right. you said, hallucination, something in specific that made them feel like they had to protect someone. Yeah. And that's kind of lacking here. And that, I think, is one of the biggest reasons why I can't, I can't fully 
you know, decide which side I'm leaning towards because I don't see how he went from fine to, you know, maybe thinking he was going there for the barbecue to all of a sudden I need a tire iron, iron and, you know, I'm, I'm struggling as to where that connection went. But then you have to think about sleepwalking and, you know, they might just not have made that connection. You know, there could be something they don't remember, you know. Yeah. It's, it's also weird. I mean, his version of events is that he basically remembers falling asleep and that he awakens to the face of his mother-in-law and he says she looks sad which is, it's a little bit of a bizarre statement. Yeah. Um, but then you get him going to the police station and he's telling them that I've killed my in-laws. I've, I've killed both of them. So shouldn't there be some memory in there or is it just the realization when he woke up that he saw them and thought that he had killed them both? Um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of questions that really stick in my brain about this one. I'm really surprised that he actually got off using the sleepwalking defense. I am honestly too, because again, I hadn't looked into this and about halfway through your story, I was sure he was going to be found guilty. I was yeah. almost positive. So I'm, I'm very, very shocked. And I would love to see all of the different court records. I would love to go through that. There has to be <laughs> something more there that these jurors really believed. Man. Yeah, I can't also, believe Hollywood just hasn't even really taken a crack at this. I think there was a TV movie made that was yeah. kind of very loosely based on it, but uh, no, like, you know, really good detailed, exactly, get the court records and write a script around just that conversation. I'm sure it'd be very, very interesting. Oh, absolutely. And I almost also wish there was more when it came to his wife and her thoughts. Yeah. Now, the Psychology Today paper... Um, they make a pretty strong standing that they don't know if they believe this either. Uh, here's a quote from it. It is highly, it is unlikely that enough visual information about the environment can be unconsciously processed for a person to be able to complete extremely complex actions in relatively unfamiliar surroundings. It is also highly dubious that Kenneth could have stayed asleep during the whole, the whole ordeal. It's a myth that you cannot awaken a sleepwalker. It may be unwise to awaken them because they may end up confused or terrified, but it's no harder to awaken a sleepwalker than to awaken any person in a state of deep sleep. It is just plainly implausible that a severe struggle with his in-laws, them screaming at him, asking him what he's doing, pleading with him, failed to wake him up. That's a very good point. Yeah, I think that's a really, really solid point. And it's kind of... Um, I'm surprised that the prosecution wouldn't have, have tried to hit that, you know, bring some experts in to literally just say that, just say, how, how did he go this far without being woken up at some point? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how much I believe this story. <laughs> I really don't. Oh yeah. Goodness. So, um, and I bumped into all kinds of other stuff. Did you run into some other interesting cases that you wanted to just yeah. briefly touch on here? Yes. I ran into a mother that actually ended up murdering her daughter. But again, it was from this position of fear and wanting to protect. So basically she had a lot of struggles with, I think, depression and sleepwalking, um, insomnia, and she would wake up in the middle of the night in her daughter's room doing different acts. Like one time she was brushing spiders that she, you know, was dreaming were all over her daughter off of her. And then in the instance where she ended up killing her daughter, she thought that an army had invaded her house. Whoa. And that was, I mean, that one was a wild one. Um, and then there was actually a father in the town near me that ended up um, suffocating his young son. He, and this was another case that reminds me a lot of the Kenneth Parks case because, you know, he got off. He wasn't found guilty, but he had issues with money <laughs> and there was a lot of things that really looked like motive for murder and you know again while he was you know doing this to his son he had other children that were screaming at him and the fact that he didn't wake up now that i'm putting you know more information together mm -hmm. i just don't know but he i mean he was off he wasn't found guilty yeah that's bizarre uh, i actually hit an article from everydayhealth.com about sex somnia I, I saw a lot about that, actually. Yeah. Yep. September 7th, 2018. Once again, we're in Canada. 
Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, a man was found not criminally responsible for a sexual assault due to sexomnia, a rare sleep disorder that causes people to engage in sexual activities while they're asleep. Uh, experts in court talked about a head injury he had a decade before him suffering from sleep apnea and his family history with sleepwalking. And once again, we're hearing these same building blocks for these exactly. legal defenses. Uh, the prosecution insisted he was in an alcohol-induced blackout, but obviously the court didn't see it their way. Uh, of all the things that really bothered me about this case, I mean, it's terrible. You, yeah. We're talking about a sexual assault and the fact that that he got off on it. Um, but outside of all that, the Toronto Sun that reported on this decided they didn't use the real names of the people involved. Yeah. And what name do you think they gave him? Did they give him your name? Yeah. Yeah, they gave me John, this is so unfortunate. <laughs> Why does this keep happening to you? Talk about the not winner. Yeah, I know that, that would be John. Uh, I, I, I've read a lot about those, though, and you wouldn't think that happens. It happens a lot more often than you think it does. But then yeah. again, that hits on the point of how did they not wake up? <laughs> right, right. I don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, well, that was a really weird story because uh, he was actually staying at a home with his girlfriend and they went out with a friend of theirs and she was sleeping in another room and she's the one that he assaulted. So, yeah. And uh, Sleepwalking apparently is strange. it is, it is. And once again, it just makes you wonder, is this, is this real or is this just mm -hmm. a legal defense at this point? Uh, they report that they've given him treatment and that he now has an alarm on his door. So if he wakes up in the middle of the night and tries to leave the room, there's an alarm that goes off. Um, I don't know. I don't know how helpful. That's, that's crazy. But imagine on the flip side of being that sleepwalker and just not knowing what you might do. Because I'm yeah. sure at this point he lives in complete and total fear. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I was in a situation like that, I would probably be, I don't know that I would only do an alarm. I would probably I would lock locks. myself to the bed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd have some type of mechanism that would... Uh, keep me in bed or like a tether so that as if I got out of bed, it would pull and an alarm would go off <laughs> and the lights would go on. <laughs> Something. I mean, there, there has to be a way to treat that. Yeah, it does. It sounds terrible from both points of view. And of course, then we have this question on top of it of, is it real? Exactly. Uh, I, I also did bump into an occurrence of sleep painting or an, an artist that actually all of his work happens when he's sleepwalking. Wow. Lee Hadwin. Yeah. Lee Hadwin is a Welsh Australian artist. According to his website, www.leehadwin.com with no training and no inclination in his waking life to be an artist. Lee draws and sketches portraits, figures, and landscapes in his sleep. Now with interest from galleries around the world, TV offers and talks about writing a book. Lee has discovered a global demand for his work. He even has a YouTube channel and a few videos showing him in this sort of drawing trance in the middle of the night, scribbling away as someone else in the house films him. In one video, the person filming calls out his name a few times, but he doesn't respond. There's also an eeriness to the videos, uh, which may have to do with the fact that he's only wearing Speedos while he's doing this. Oh, is, no. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, his, no. and his friend is filming him, following him around oh, the house my goodness. while he's sleepwalking. Um, once again, it's one of those things. And I watched the videos and I'm like, is this real? I mean, the guy is literally yelling, Lee, Lee. <laughs> and he's not waking up while he's drawing. See, and this is where I struggle because I myself may or may not have sleepwalked a few times in my life. I hope this doesn't make anyone scared of me. <laughs> Uh-oh. But Do I need to check in with Powell, make sure he's okay? He sleepwalks too. So we're just in trouble in oh, general. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> but I will say, one the thing that I do when I sleepwalk, and I did see that you have a pattern of things that you do. So that's why I think they link people with night terrors and you know certain behaviors with the potential of being violent. Um, but I have brushed teeth before. Like I've, I've, I've well, woken up technically and I've gone to brush my sister's teeth. And the other few times that I've done it, I always get in the shower. And like, I, it's like I'm waking up and doing my morning routine. So I literally oh. woke up. Well, I keep saying wake up, but no. <laughs> my dad one time had to help me out of the shower after I'd been in there for a few hours. <laughs> he said that he was out on the couch watching TV and I got up and he assumed I was just using the restroom and I just never came back. 
<laughs> and he went to check. And I mean, I had showered, I was doing my hair. And so that's again, where I, I'm not sure how to feel about, you know, it should be easy to wake people up. And I know some experts have said that, but I took a whole shower. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you would think that would be one thing that wakes someone up. And I think right. it was maybe only a week ago or not even a week ago, Powell had a little sleepwalking episode and he always walks into our closet. Don't tell him I told you that. Sorry, Powell, if you're listening, which I know oh. you are. Just ignore that. You didn't hear it. <laughs> but he always just walks into our closet or walks into the bathroom and will just stand there. And yeah. it is very difficult for me to wake him up to get him back in bed. Yeah. And I mean, I could probably slap this man, knock him out, full-blown tackle him like a football player, and it would still be difficult to wake him up. So maybe it's just we're all sensitive to different things. But then again, that just adds to the confusion. And yeah. And you're, you're basically making the case for why this defense works, because like I said earlier, yeah. you talk to enough people and it doesn't take many people you have to talk to. You're going to hear compelling stories about what they've done in terms of sleepwalking. So it does happen. We know it's a real thing. We know that people do this. It's the big question of in these particular instances with all of these complex actions, does it really make sense? And we're so curious about it. This is where we're going to put up one of the polls for today's episode. What do you guys think about these cases we spoke about to today? Do you think that these cases really have sleepwalkers that experience this? Or do you think that this was a legal defense and people might not be telling the truth about what actually happened in these particular instances? So we'll bring that poll up right now. All right. Wow. Interesting one, Danielle. Um, who do you think wins this one? Um, absolutely you. I think mine was interesting and, and bizarre. And I think the reason I was drawn to it is because I really wanted to find someone who was found not guilty. And that's not, I mean, it's common, but a lot of the stories are kind of the same. But man, yours, I think I'm drawn to the most because I feel like he's guilty and he was found not guilty. And just the chain of events and all the very specific things he did, I'm throwing my flag in right here. Like, I vote for you. <laughs> Everyone just go vote for John. That was a good one. It's one of those stories I just, I cannot yeah. get enough of. I want more details. I want to read police reports. I mean, I just, I want exactly. to know more about this because I feel like I'm not happy I, I don't feel like I know the truth, even after exactly. this, even after all this research and reading all this input, I'm just completely down the middle of, is this real or not? Or did this guy get away with, with murdering his mother-in-law? So yeah, oh, I'm, I'm still at a loss on that one. Exactly. Uh, well, that is it for the sleepwalking defense. Um, we have next, our next month's episode already planned. Danielle, you want to let them know what we're going to be talking about? We're going to be bringing it down a notch next month because I know this was just a little bit intense little heavy. with <laughs> the craziest getaway. Yes, that, that does could be sound very interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I can see that going all kinds of different ways. You could have a getaway from a bank robbery. You can have a getaway from an assault of some kind. So um, really an open ended topic. I'm looking forward to jumping into that one, too. I already have one in mind. Oh, so just really? prepare yourself. Oh, it's something I, it's a case I've been interested in for years. So you just buckle in, John. I'm All taking right. my prize back next month. All right. Well, hey, you haven't lost it yet. It is, it is up to the audience to let us know. <laughs> so we know that we're only a once a month podcast and we frequently hear from you guys, particularly on Twitter, you know, what else can we listen to uh, if, if we're into true crime and stuff like that? So Danielle and I have talked about it and we've decided that we're going to feature some promos for other podcasts here. Uh, the first one that we want to do is for Mike Morford, who really helped us get this podcast off the ground. He's been my go-to guy for any questions I had about uh, you know, particular websites or how to submit the podcast, how to get it on iTunes, all that kind of good stuff. Plus, I've used him as a source before for an episode of Brain Scratch. So here we have a promo for one of his podcasts. He does several. This one is for The Murder in My Family. This is Mike Morford. You may know me as co-host of the true crime podcast, Criminology. I'd like to invite you to listen to my new podcast, The Murder in My Family, which is out right now. In each episode, I discuss a murder case and include an interview with a family member of the victim to discuss the aftermath of the murder. Some of the cases I cover are well known, and others you probably haven't heard of. 
and I have several episodes currently available for you to binge on, including episodes about the Delphi murders, the Golden State Killer, and the Colonial Parkway murders, just to name a few. Here's a small sample. Bill Thomas is the brother of Kathy Thomas, and he agreed to talk with me about the murder in his family. Well, Mike, at the risk of sounding like every other proud big brother around the world, Kathy was an amazing person. And one thing I wanted to get across is how important it is that the victims that I'll be talking about in these cases aren't just statistics. You know, they were real people. They're more than just murder victims. For me, knowing that he has a family and that he gets to see his kids every day and that he gets to be there for his kids growing up, like, it's just, it's not fair. He was the most funniest man I've ever met. He was everybody's friend. New episodes come out on Saturdays, and you can find The Murder of My Family wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe today so you don't miss an episode. What do you think, Danielle? I'm telling you, see, this is a podcast that I have not listened to before, but I cannot wait to go and binge. I'm someone who just binges podcasts, like all their seasons, <laughs> all their episodes, and this is one that I'm going to be hopping on. His voice is very calming. Yeah, yeah. He did <laughs> a lot of work also with the uh, East Area Rapist case. He was at CrimeCon. Um, unfortunately we didn't get to connect there, but, uh, he's reached out to me several times. We've, we've been in regular contact and the murder in my family. I really like his approach of, um, bringing people on. I like his interview style and he kind of mentioned it in the promo, but I just want to echo it because, you know, people that know my work know that I strive for this as well. I love the respect that he gives to these cases when he's talking about them. And in particular, if you get into interviewing family members and stuff like that, it is so important to have that level of decency and respect. Exactly. That's a very sensitive topic. And just yeah. from listening to the promo, he seems to handle it very, very well. That's a brave thing to do. And I, I personally as well love that setup. It reminds me a lot of the Vanished podcast. So yeah. I'm very interested, very interested to go and listen after this. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, next time around, Danielle is going to have a podcast promo for you guys as well. We hope you, that you'll check them out. Let us know what you think. Uh, you can reach us at our YouTube channels. Mine is Lord and Arts, L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. You can also find me at Twitter, at Lord and Arts. And you can find me on my YouTube channel, which is Danielle Hallen, D-A-N-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E, so there is no I and Hallen is H-A-L-L-A-N. And you can find me on Twitter at Danielle Hallen. We also have an email box. If you want to submit topic ideas, uh, suggestions for the format of the show, anything, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com. And don't forget before you go to absolutely put in your vote for who brought the most bizarre story. Yeah. I'm yeah. just, I'm telling you, it's John. <laughs> <laughs> I've given up already on this episode. That was a great story. Don't give it up yet. Don't give it <laughs> up yet. It's up to them. Uh, Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to give a massive thank you to our patrons. They are the ones who are bringing this show to you with very limited ads. There are no ads here on the audio version and just, I think, one, maybe two ads on the YouTube version. So definitely a massive thank you to them. They have all been so supportive. And we also record a special segment for them every month. So if you want just a little bit more of Crime After Crime, uh, you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, and then you will also get that special segment. If you enjoyed this, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. We still need help growing, and you are absolutely a major part of that. Well, guys, I can't wait to see what the votes are, and we will see you next time on Crime After Crime. Crime After Crime.